the epistemology behind our wrecked cultural landscape. I'm Cody Leibel. You're listening to For the New Christian Intellectual. Today I'm talking with Jacob Brunton about several corrupt ideas from Europe about 200 years ago that continue to stretch their poisonous roots out into our society today and to ruin our nation and our churches. Modern culture has been shaped by Hume, Kant, and Hegel, and Marx and other postmodern descendants of that stream of ideas. And this has led many people today to embrace the ideology of postmodernism. It has led others to reject ideology as such. So it's led to concrete bound mindsets, making people incapable of understanding the causes of things. And this keeps them from succeeding as they attempt to fight in the culture war. Look at how the culture war is playing out in the church today. On one side of the battle, you see the relevant magazine, Gospel Coalition, Christianity Today category, which I would call the quote progressive quote Christians, which are really neither progressive nor Christian. And on the other side of the battle, you see reactionaries, tradcons, biblicists, presuppositionalists, theonomists, and monarchists. These are the people that are purportedly the allies of my cause in the culture war. And then in the middle, you find the weak need pragmatists, the would be politicians, posers, capitulators, and seminary presidents who cannot even find the courage to call for a blatant fraud like the plagiarist Ed Litton to step down from the presidency of the nation's largest conservative Christian denomination. So to understand why this battle is going so poorly, you need to ask what is missing? What's missing is an honest commitment to the full pursuit of truth and the moral fiber to take responsibility for that truth. What is missing is exactly that which for the new Christian intellectual was made to defend. That is the role of the mind in Christian life. Amen. So we want to recover the role of the mind in the Christian life. And Cody, as you just said, the the disaster of the mind in the Christian life began a couple hundred years ago with people that many of us don't know their names. At least many Christians wouldn't unless they've, they've studied some history of philosophy. So let's dive into that. Uh, who are those guys and how did their philosophies carry over into the cultural decay that we're seeing all around us today? We thought to do this topic because of a conversation we were having in a message group with several friends, and they were asking, hey, can you explain this rationalism, empiricism framework? I've heard of the rationalists and the empiricists. And what does this have to do with Kant? What does this have to do with philosophy and the way that our culture is today? And so in this discussion group, we ended up saying, well, okay, so there, yeah, you're right. There is this rationalist trend or school of thought. It's, it's a loose collection of ideas and concerns from several important European philosophers, especially starting with Rene Descartes and going on to others, including Leibniz and Spinoza and, and several others. And then there was a counter movement, which included people like, um, like John Locke and David Hume that attempted to be empiricists. Empiricists had a different perspective on how we should go about the project of philosophy. Where does knowledge come from? And they raised challenges against the rationalists, but the rationalists raised pretty good challenges against the empiricists. And it got to the point where people wondered, maybe there is no possibility for knowledge at all. And Hume is famous. David Hume is famous for his skepticism. But then Immanuel Kant came in and said, no, wait, there are some true things in each of these two schools of thought. Let's synthesize them. And uh, so we actually know about something called the Kantian synthesis, and he created what he thought was an answer, but it ended up being an explanation for uh, or demonstration of the idea that we actually cannot have certainty. We actually cannot have knowledge. And he did this self-consciously as uh, as a strategy so that he could deny reason and make room for faith. And that was his purported solution. People that came after him rejected faith, but they said, but we like your conclusion that, that reason is invalid. And so you can see what would happen if you, if you extrapolate. You get postmodernism. You get cultural relativism. And that has carried us down through history and, and led to the kind of political situation we have today, led to the kind of society we have today. So we explained this in that discussion we were having with so, some of our social justice contra friends. And we realized, you know what, this is something that Jacob and I take for granted as being you know, important to understanding the history of ideas. And we come in, for the new Christian intellectual comes in and says, we actually believe that ideology, the integrated approach to philosophy is a good thing. 
And we're trying to convince our culture war allies that that is the case, but they don't always believe that that's the case. Many of them will say, no, no, if it's ideological, if it's system building, then it's just suspicious. So we have a disagreement with that group, and that would be a lot of tradcons. We would say your approach to this is concrete bound, and you just want to say, you know, I believe in A, I believe in B and C, but you don't want to say, I believe they all fit together in a certain system. I believe there's a fundamental principle here, like individual rights and capitalism. They don't want to say that. And so that's how it actually plays out in the culture war. And then there, there is a trend facing the church today of people that have rejected ideology and they've just gone way over into pragmatism. And you can see that in the, you know, the seeker sensitive movement and whatever church growth business model leads to the most people in the pews. So th these are some of the things that are at stake for us and why we'd want to do a video about this today. We want to show you why the mind of Christians seems so weak right now. And so we're going to actually dig in and, and share some ideas. Jacob, what do you think is uh, a good starting place for them? So I, I would go back to Kant and just real briefly summarize the, the essence of what he did in philosophy, how that bled over into Hegel, and then how that kind of infiltrates the rest of culture on all sides today. So going back to Kant, Kant basically drew a, a sharp line, a chasm between reality and the life of our minds. And he said that there is no way for our minds, what he called the phenomenal world, what we think and, and what we what we think we see, what we experience with our sense perception, all of that, that's all that's all in your head. And there's no way for you to cross the chasm of what you experience in your head and the way that reality is in itself. So he, he ripped the two apart. He ripped reality from reason or from thinking or from the life of the mind. And so there's no way to cross that chasm. And almost everybody who came after him fundamentally agrees with that. Uh, not necessarily saying that they like it. Some say that it sucks, but that's just the way it is, right? But almost everybody takes that for granted that we, we can't get to the way things are in themselves through reason, through any sort of rational justification. Now, what does that result in? You, you could say, okay, well, then there is no truth. For all practical purposes, there's no truth. If we can't get to it, there's, we can't get to ultimate reality. So there's just my truth my, in my head, what, what I experience. And there's your truth, what you experience. And each of us has our own truths. And so that, that's the, the extreme relativism that we see being played out in many ways among the left today. Then you could also say, well, no, we can't reach that uh, reality through reason, but we can re reach it through some sort of mystical experience. So we have to get out of our heads and go into our hearts. And so we have, just have to feel really hard. And if you have really good feelings or really fuzzy feelings, or if you're on enough of an acid trip uh, or take enough shrooms or whatever the case may be, some sort of mystical experience where, oh, now you get ultimate reality. You're escaping this phenomenal world of what you, that the prison of your mind and you're getting in touch with ultimate reality through some sort of mystical experience. You could call that faith, and some Christians today do that. Some, especially like the the self-professing fideus, would definitely say, "No, no, get out of your mind. Just go into sort of a, a, a mystical state of humming and and drumming up emotions uh, and thinking about God, uh, but not too strongly, not too rationally." And whatever you feel ends up being true and, and what God's leading you to. And, and you even said with a lot of progressive Christians, right? A lot of progressive Christians would say, no, no, that, that's all reason. That's all logic. I don't want that. I feel like Jesus is telling me that loving my neighbor means stealing from you. And therefore it's true. You also see that with the charismatic movement. Yes, absolutely. They, yeah. The charismatic movement is, is a big example of that. Uh, and then you could say, all right, well, we can't, get to ultimate reality, but we have to just assume certain things in order to get along in this world. And so, and, and that's where you get the pragmatists. And these are the rational conservatives that you see today and over the past few centuries of, well, no, we can't get to ultimate reality. We, we can't be certain about it. So don't, 
don't dig your heels in, don't die on that hill. But there are certain things that we just have to pragmatically assume in order to get along in life. And so we're going to just assume those things because they work, because they make life easier for us or for the common good. But it's not a principle. It's, it's, not, it's not overarching. It's not, it's not really that important. So it's okay to fudge on it. And that's where you get the pragmatism that, that will say out of one side of its mouth, no, don't, don't do that. That's wrong. You know, that, that's against the common good. Uh, we've got to have certain principles that we live by. But then at the same time, it's going to say, bah, on something that it likes, on, on one of its idols, it's going to say, eh, principles, principles, like th that's ideology. That's all impractical. That's all abstract. That's all in the numinal. We can't reach that. We can't know that. So let's just go along to get along. And, and, and that's most conservative Christians today. They're this sort of wishy-washy mixture of on things that they like they are going to take a hard stand and claim to have objective truth on that issue and claim to want to enforce objective principles in, in a very uh, rock solid and unyielding way. But then on things that they don't really care about uh, or, or ways that it advant it's advantageous to them, they're going to say, eh, it's, it's not that big of a deal. Let, let's not be too ideological. Let's not be so abstract. You know, let, let's just, let's not be so hard lined. Uh, that's especially for the way conservative Christians and pastors interact with political topics. And one of the reasons is because they don't have a Bible verse saying that you need to vote Republican and that you absolutely need to not vote Democrat. So then they will say, there are some broad principles in the Bible, but they're not going to say, let's look at general revelation. And from general revelation, we can know that we have the right to defend ourselves, that therefore that we should have the right to bear arms. Therefore, the constitution is a good thing. I've heard many pastors that love the Bible simply just tell me right to my face. I don't know why you worship the constitution. I don't know why you elevate the constitution as if it's from God. It's not from God. Well, the constitution is built on principles from general revelation and general revelation is from God. And so they're ignoring that. And, and that's why you see so many pastors today that don't have the ability to uh, take a strong position on politics the way the pastors rightly did around the time of the American Revolution. And think about it. If, if you believe or if you bought into, even if you've never heard of Kant before, if you bought into Kant's lie that we can't get to ultimate reality, well, you've got to have some substitute. You've got to, you've got to functionally believe in some sort of objectivity. We point this out about leftists progressive Christians all the time, you know, they, they claim that there's no truth, but they, they don't act like it, right? They, they stop at red lights. <laughs> they, um, they, they don't use their hairdryer in the bathtub. Like that, they, they, they know that there really is an objective reality so that they're being inconsistent. Well, it's the same thing with many Christians who implicitly accept this idea. You, you have to have something to substitute for that. And so what, what many Christians do is they say, they almost treat the Bible as if it's like this one thing that made it through that gap. Like th there's this gap between reality and my mind. And the only thing that made it through because God you know, pushed it through is this book, the Bible. Uh, and, and so I, I, all I can rely on as objective is, is anything that this book says. Never mind the fact that you have to uh, interpret that book using things that are outside of the book. That there's there's all kinds of annoying assumptions that they're ignoring right there, but th that that's what you have to do, and and step outside of the religious versions of conservatism for a second, and just think of you know general secular tradconism. I, I know most tradcons are religious and and Christian of some variety, whether Catholic or Protestant, but there are some that are are conservative and and they they like tradition and they don't really care that much about religion. But what they do is, is they treat whatever is traditional, wh whatever my ancestors did as the standard for objective reality or objective truth, right? So everybody's got to have something that they appeal to functionally for objectivity. And when you believe that there is no way for you to reach it with your mind in a rational way, then you've got to erect some sort of idol to serve as that arbiter for you. And, and you can even treat the Bible as an idol in that respect. 
especially if, if you're if you're using the Bible to deny God's clear general revelation, then yes, you are treating it as a as an idol. Uh, but uh, you know, obviously, progressive leftists treat contemporary cultural opinion, con- contemporary majority vote as their idol. Well, it, by the same token, the trad cons want to treat historical majority vote as their idol. Uh, it, it's it's not functionally any different. You know, something interesting about the pattern that we see between the Christians who are traditionalists versus progressivists today is it's got a lot of parallels to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And, you know, the Pharisees would have been the tradcons in that day because they appealed to the tradition of man, which they enforced and that they were the arbiters of. And they were also the most knowledgeable in scripture of anybody at that time. And they thought that their interpretation of scripture was the only correct one. And Jesus condemns them. And he says in Luke 12, 56, you hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? He condemns them on the fact that they were closed off to what was being revealed by God to them through general revelation. In this case, through the the witnessing of Jesus's life and the witnessing of miracles and also the, the factors about the fact that he was fulfilling prophecy, which they were aware of. They had this construct of, you know, this is this is the life that we are supposed to live. Yeah, that reminds me of recently someone posted something on Twitter about uh, an old school Baptist from a couple centuries ago. Uh, in their statement of faith, they they talked about pastors being called to call out false preachers of the gospel or or uh, evil men who are fe- who are teaching evil ideas. And, and you know that's different. That's way different than what we think today. Today we think, oh no, just let their local church handle it, right? And I posted a screenshot of that on Facebook, and some Catholic tradcon came on and said, why why should anybody listen to that local pastor rather than the false teacher? And you know, obviously his answer is supposed to be, well, if it's not from Rome, then we know that it's wrong. My reply to him was, each person should listen to the reasons of both and judge accordingly, right? And, and that's what we see in Scripture. Whenever uh, the the Sadducees or the Pharisees are appealing to the traditions of men or to the traditional interpretations, Jesus says, have you not read? Have you not understood? J- Jesus chastises them for not thinking independently about the text or about the reality of what God has done and the way that God has made them. And, and this, this is not just uh, special revelation. It, it's also general revelation, right? Paul appeals to the general revelation of the way that men and women are created differently. So the, the, the emphasis in the Bible is on thinking independently about God's reality because you're going to stand alone. And I always talk about this. This is a, a common theme, but it, it needs to be repeated. You're, you're going to stand alone at the judgment seat and answer for what you believed, what you taught, and what you valued. You're, you're not going to be able to get, use the excuse that everybody else was doing the same thing or that everybody in history prior to you, all of your heroes believed the same thing. That's irrelevant. The question is, what did you believe? What did you value? What did you do? What was your character and why? And and if you are coasting through this life, coasting through the Christian life on the coattails of other people and other people's beliefs merely because it's traditional or merely because it's popular today, then you're in grave danger. To understand how these ideas have worked their way into the church movement and into our society, I want to share with you some information about Hegel and about, you know, his predecessor, Immanuel Kant, and about how this, uh, both of them, their work led people to embrace collectivism as an answer to how to think about what is true and what is false. You know, Kant's main contribution was, like Jacob already described, to say that our minds do not have access to reality itself, but also he argued that the basis of your ethical theory ought to be otherism. He didn't use that word otherism, but he he said that the moral code ought to be based on your duty, and that if you have a personal interest in doing something, then that negates the moral value of it. And this was taken further by people that came after him, especially Hegel, who began to say uh, along those same lines, well, if we do know that there is such thing as right and wrong, but it's it's based on duty and it's based on uh, helping the collective, then doesn't that mean that the highest good is the big collective, which would be the state? And so Hegel would argue 
that not only was Kant right, but he would take it further. And he would, he would say that whatever is good for the collective, in this case, the German people, was what Hegel argued. That is the essence of what's good. You can see how later on Marx would adapt that. Later on, Hitler would adapt that. But they, they were taking a collectivistic approach because that's the only alternative that you have if, if your own mind is not reliable as a means of connecting with reality. Then where are you going to get a connection with reality? It's got to be from somebody else's mind or some group of people. So th that has led to uh, the rampant skepticism about whether knowledge is even possible or the rampant collectivism. And that has led to, within our churches, the pragmatist movement, like the seeker-sensitive movement. But it's also led to, within our churches, the, well, you know, I can just go with my feelings movement. I wanted to mention uh, the pragmatist movement also brings us people like Ed Litton, as you mentioned in the introduction, who are compromised morally because they don't take principles seriously. It's all about power or about prestige. It's all because if, if there is no connection to reality between your mind and, and reality, then all that's left is other people's minds, your mind and other people's minds. And so you, you start to see the world through the eyes of other people. You start to see yourself through the eyes of other people. And you start to care a lot less about what's true about your own character and a lot more about what other people think about your own character. And so you become second-handed. And, and so it makes sense that you would care a lot more about what people think about me rather than the truth about what I really am. As long as people think of me as a good man, then it's okay for me to tell myself I'm a good man, no matter how much integrity I've thrown out the window, no matter how much of a scoundrel I really am. And, and that doesn't just go for Ed Litton, that goes for people like Al Mohler and Ligon Duncan and all of those compromisers and capitulators in the church who have sold the church down the woke river. I guarantee you that the way that they comfort themselves at night is second-handed and collectivistic in that way. They, they, think, they think about all the people who still have high opinions of them. That's the only thing that they can think about in order to comfort their souls against the, the nagging knowledge that they really have compromised and sold out. Well, they're the representative of God. So if people have a high opinion of them, that means they have a high opinion of God. And just as we could quote J.D. Greer, you know, he endorsed the docent research group that was writing his sermons. Mm -hmm. Thanks for making me look good, docent. Yeah. And then, of course, Ed Litton stealing sermons from J.D. Greer, who bought them from Docent. And I think uh, it's just, who knows where the sermons actually came from. And we've got Ed Litton stealing sermons from Keller and just it's and then he and his wife teaming up together to preach those sermons from Keller, where it's just word for word and thought for thought. So I wanted to read to you about uh, this is a quote from The Ominous Parallels by Leonard Peikoff about the, the history and, and especially Kant. So he says there are two different kinds of subjectivism distinguished by their answers to the question whose consciousness creates reality. Kant rejected the older of these two, which was the view that each man's feelings create a private universe for him. Instead, Kant ushered in the era of social subjectivism, the view that it is not the consciousness of individuals, but of groups that creates reality. In Kant's system, mankind as a whole is the decisive group. What creates the phenomenal world is not the idiosyncrasies of particular individuals, but the mental structure common to all men. Later philosophers accepted Kant's fundamental approach, but carried it a step further. If, many claimed, the mind's structure is a brute given, which cannot be explained, as Kant has said, then there is no reason why all men should have the same mental structure. There is no reason why mankind should not be splintered into competing groups, each defined by its own distinctive type of consciousness each vying with the others to capture and control reality. The first world movement thus to pluralize the Kantian position was Marxism, which propounded a social subjectivism in terms of competing economic classes. On this issue, as on many others, the Nazis follow the Marxists, but they substitute race for class. And you can see that playing out even in today where we have movements proclaiming that there is a black way of thinking and a white way of thinking. And then we see that playing out in even among self-identifying Christians, where there are people that claim to be Christians that say, like uh, Tabidi Ani Abwile said about a year back or two years back, where he said, you need to fundamentally identify with me as a, as a black man. And after you've sufficiently done that and paid reparations and made everything right from what happened to our ancestors between some other people's ancestors, then we can identify together as brothers in Christ. Uh, so that's, that's one way of, you know, how this 
this class consciousness has worked itself into the church, but then you also have white Christians who are, who are taking this nativist ethnocentrist position that, you know, I ought to, I ought to love white people more than I love black people. They actually are going out on in public and saying that now, which is just so anti-gospel. And it's just a justification for their desire to create an ethno state or to limit the amount of people of a certain color that will be allowed to live in their country. And they do it on the basis of the same idea that, well, we have our way of thinking. This is my people's collective way of thinking. Some of them will even say, I'm not, not necessarily saying that a different culture is worse, but they will say, I belong with my people and with my people's way of thinking. And because, because I think that they've absorbed, whether they know it or not, some of these ideas from Hegel, uh, some of these yeah. ideas that it's the collective that creates truth. Yeah, they think that they're fighting the leftist woke mob by accepting their fundamental premise about uh, the different class consciousness based on race. It's really absurd when you think about it, and it's it's indicative of how sadly foolish conservatives have become. That that their barometer for what's right is does it piss off the left, and and if it pisses off the left enough, then it must be good. And it's like, can, can you think a little bit deeper than that? Can you can you try to to be a little bit more rational? And and sadly, I mean, they, they can't because they, they've been taught this uh, Kantian postmodern divide between reason and reality, just the way that the leftists have, but in a more family friendly way, right? And that, that's really the only difference when when you get down to it is that the the trad cons prefer more family friendly type stuff, and the leftist progressives prefer anti-family friendly stuff but they they both are collectivistic they both are relativistic because they both under are they, they both accept this divide between reality and reason something that i really strongly value in ayn rand's epistemological work is that she explains in the human mind how does your capacity to make observations relate to your capacity to integrate them using logic and that's those two categories, your observations and your logic, they represent the focuses of those two movements that Kant was trying to reconcile. The, the movement of the empiricists, those that are looking, those that, are, that only want to uh, report that which they see, and then those who say, no, no, you actually have more capacity than that, and perhaps a more fundamental capacity to know truth comes from your ability to look at something logically, and that would be the rationalists' movement. And um, be careful about the the use the use of the term rationalism because there are you know people like presuppositionalists today are going to say that Cody Leibold is a rationalist, but we're talking about an, a historical trend and movement of which I am not a part. I would be much more along the lines of Ayn Rand, but she comes in and says you um, you can relate observations and um, and you can do it in a way that there is no contradictions, and that's the process of logic. And she explains in, uh, you can see it in Peikoff's book, Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand. You can also see it in the Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, written by Rand, where they go into the, the process of how concepts are actually formed. They explain it in such a way that uh, she resolves the challenges that were posed by Hume, the Humean skepticism. This is all connected to the overall project at for the new Christian intellectual. Like, for example, if you've been tracing our debate with Seth Bloomsburg or other presuppositionalists, they always go to Hume and and implicitly to Kant. And, you know, that's because Van Til and his way of looking at, at apologetics traces to Doiverd and traces to several others. Uh, I think Kuiper and several others, but then eventually it traces back to Immanuel Kant. And and that, that that's the system in which they were thinking that. And, and, so, and so, when the presuppositionalists critique us, they always are going to say, "Why are you a uh, you know a enlightenment thinker? Why do you, why do you embrace these enlightenment ideas?" But we're going to say, "No, no, you're the one that's embracing the premises of Hume and of Kant that lead to skepticism, which you try to resolve." Yeah, Van Til's whole project is built on the assumption that we can't it, agreeing with Kant, we can't reach ultimate reality with our minds. We have to just assume it. We just have, have to just presuppose it, right? I, I mean, and that's that's exactly what everybody at the time who, so 
right after Kant made this quote unquote breakthrough onto the European scene, everyone at the time was being split into one of two camps. You either say, okay, well then there is no truth and I'm just going to live as if nothing is true, as if everything's just relative. And so you had, you know, like the, the, what the equivalent of modern progressive leftists today. And then you have the people who say, well, okay, you're right. We can't get to the truth, but we just have to make some assumptions in order to have an orderly society because I want order and I want a rough semblance of morality. Uh, and so the, and those were the pragmatists and the conservatives and, and Van Til is really just taking the conservative fork of that and baptizing it in the Bible, in, in Christianity and saying, well, you're right. We can't get to it, but we just have to assume it in order to get along. We have to assume that the Bible is the word of God, meaning we have to presuppose it. We can't get to it. We can't tie it to ultimate reality. So, and, and he's not the only one. There, there are many others, but he, he's probably the, the most famous Christian systematizer of Kant's uh, ultimate fundamental assumption there. Have you noticed the way that Christians speak about the I, the ideas throughout history, like for example, Plato and Aristotle, it's super indicative. If, if you find out whether somebody prefers Plato or Aristotle, you're going to find out a lot more about their approach to reason and about whether reason, reason should be observation oriented versus whether it's, it's something different than that and ultimately mystical. Uh, I want to read to you a quote. This is another one from Peikoff. He says that if we view the West's philosophic development in terms of essentials, three fateful turning points stand out. Three major philosophers who, above all else, are responsible for generating the disease of collectivism and transmitting it to the dictators of our century. The three are Plato, Kant, Hegel. The antidote to them is Aristotle. That's from his book, The Ominous Parallels. So uh, there's a lot more that we could go into that Peikoff has said about this topic because he has studied history and the history of philosophy and said great, very useful things about it. We're going to go more into that in our patron-only exclusive version. We're going to uh, give you an extended discussion. So if you have found value in this, I would say definitely become a patron. For $1 a month, you get access to the extended versions, uh, quite a bit more in-depth discussion from us. And for $10 a month, what we're doing is you can join us live. You can interact with us either on video or comments or send in your questions and comments ahead of time. You can find all of that at christianintellectual.com slash Patreon. Jacob, should we wrap up this with any particular closing thoughts? I mean, it seems like this is always my closing thought, but you've got to take responsibility for what you believe. You have to exert the effort to think independently and rationally about what you believe because you are ultimately going to be held responsible for that and that alone you can't rely on what the modern culture is saying what your favorite evangelical heroes today are saying what the people in the past were saying the, those might be relative good indicators to one degree or another but ultimately at the end of the day if they've made a mistake and you buy into that mistake you're gonna be held responsible for it because you allowed them to do your thinking for you so stop it stop treading or, or stop stop uh riding on other people's coattails intellectually grow up be mature and learn how to use your mind and and most fundamentally reject the postmodern idea that we can't get to ultimate reality through our our reasoning capacity that we can't understand ultimate reality through reason you can god designed you so that you can now get to work there is a quote from Ayn Rand, the men who are not interested in philosophy need it most urgently. They are most helplessly in its power. The men who are not interested in philosophy absorb its principles from the cultural atmosphere around them, from schools, colleges, books, magazines, newspapers, movies, television, etc. Who sets the tone of a culture? A small handful of men, the philosophers. Others follow their lead, either by conviction or by default. That's in Philosophy Who Needs It, page six. Well, it's becoming more clear in 2021 when we look at who are the culture makers that it's a small cabal and that the reason why they're able to have power is because the pastors across the country that even are conservative have outsourced their thinking the pastors in local churches here in Irvine and in Orange County are letting Mark Dever and Jonathan Lehman Ed Stetzer and Timothy Keller tell them what the correct response is to dictatorships and the correct response is to roll over it's going to stop somewhere. It's going to stop when the men in the church say, I will no longer attend your church. I will no longer fund it.
And if you'd like help in how to do that and how to do it with a sense of moral certainty, that's what FTNCI exists to help you do. So find us at christianintellectual.com. Make sure you are subscribed to our updates. Thanks for watching today.